and I've been a lifelong stutterer, and I thought I'd get into agriculture because then I wouldn't have to talk very much. And you can see how, that, how well that's working for me. And so oh, I grew up in a Mennonite, a rural Mennonite community. One of the values or ethics that I was steeped in, like a bag of British tea, I was steeped in the idea that the loudest voice in the room probably does not have the best ideas in the room. And that there's no such thing as an individual achievement without things like community and hard work, manual labor uh, behind it, boosting it. And so I want to give an acknowledgement, a public recognition for the people back home doing the work uh, so, that I can, that, so that I can be here. And a lot of the ideas uh, that I'll share with you are ideas that our whole team has come up, up with, and I'll claim them and kind of pretend that I came up with all of them. In reality, it was a community effort. So at the beginning, I want to give a brief definition of lean. It's essentially a Japanese production system focused on eliminating waste. I'll use the term muda, muda as the Japanese translation. And essentially, you're using the waste el elimination instead of constant expansion as the best way to grow a business. It's a very ruthless system. It's a very simple system. However, it's very difficult to implement. It takes a lot of discipl discipline. And by now, it's a global system. It's used, used by, internationally by nonprofits, uh, hospitals, Farms are using it. Peace and justice organizations uh, have found lean uh, really gives a boost to their work. And so it's not a system just for the automobile industry. In fact, we're trying to take it out of the industry and bring it back onto farms. I want to attack one myth at the beginning because I got, I, I got asked this uh, question, I get asked this question all the time. Is lean going to take this soul out of my work? Is it going to strip the value system that I have? And the answer is no, it's, it can. Certainly any tool that you use uh, can be used for good or harm. And, however, Lean is a very, it's the world's most powerful production system. It can do a lot of good. Okay, it doesn't have to replace your values. It can give you time actually to focus on what you value, which is why a lot of nonprofits use Lean. And I, I grew up in an Amish community, or in, in, with Amish neighbors. And I, they use Lean systems thinking, okay? And they like to farm with horses. Very important to them to have a minimal amount of technology on their farms. So that's a constraint that they would have circled around themselves. And yet they can apply lean in that system. Uh, on our own farm, we're working on becoming a zero carbon operation. We're a net zero. Uh, we deliver all of our food within a mile and a half of us. We could certainly make more money if we drove our food to Detroit and Chicago and larger urban places. However, we draw a circle around us. We're going to say, how do we lean up even with those intentional constraints that we have? And this is actually why we got into the lean business, uh, because we were working 60 hours a week and we suddenly had kids, and we wanted to have time to spend with our kids. And here's uh, a, a bit of proof. If the video's not working, I wonder if you can give it a tick. And here's a, a bit of proof uh, at, that we're not always, we don't always do things in the most lean fashion. Uh, a three-year-old and a five-year-old son, uh, they come out and help me farm all the time. And I'll be completely honest with you, they slow down the work by at least half. <laughs> uh, but they increase the pleasure of the work, they at least triple the pleasure. So it's, it's worth it. Okay, and I want to attack another myth here too, that it's only big in uh, industrial or commercial farms uh, that have earned the right to be lean, to be efficient. Because actually we need efficiency thinking in the sustainable food movement. And small farms need to apply sustainable uh, efficiency thinking. Efficiency thinking, if they're going to be true, we're going to achieve a true, triple, socially, environmentally, and financially sustainable business. And, and Lean says you do this primarily through the reduction of waste. Okay, I begin my books with uh, these fellows here, uh, George Washington Carver, Tuskegee University, and Booker T. Wally, Tuskegee University. Uh, I found that uh, I, 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 I enjoy uh, reading history. In the evenings, I'll pick up uh, history books to read, and my, uh, everyone else reads Harry Potter novels in the house, but I'm, I got a tome of history in front of me. And I found that every culture, every culture throughout history has had some sort of an efficiency tradition. And in the U.S., we have many currents of efficiency thinking from the Amish and Mennonite communities and in the black community. Turning waste into a useful channel should be the slogan of every farmer. It was very influential uh, uh, in the 1800s, 1900s, uh, in the black community, and then Booker T. Wally, who invented the CSA thinking, the CSA system, 
uh, in the US. I said smaller is actually a way to make a profit on a farm and encouraging black farmers uh, not to get big like their white counterparts, but to get small and be more efficient. Okay, so let's jump over to the rice fields of 1700 Japan. I'd like to begin my discussions of lean thinking in the Japanese context. However, I don't like to begin at Toyota. And Toyota is credited with inventing all the lean ideas. However, the first workers at Toyota were rice farmers. And I would argue they brought an efficiency thinking with, with them onto the shop floor at Toyota. And here's the reason. During the Edo period of Japan, there's a period of great, of great isolation. And the Japanese had essentially separated themselves from China and from all other countries. And throughout history, we've had a couple of instances. Cuba would be an example. Countries that have, very small countries that have isolated themselves and their farmers have been tasked with feeding and growing populations. So these are the contexts for true lean thinking. And so this is the period of Kabuki theater, the samurai, the origami traditions, all these traditions that we think of as, as, as quintessentially Japanese. And yet look what was happening on farms at the time. These people had to work their butts off, okay? Because we had a growing population, nearly doubling population, and yet they lost their farm animals, the most important piece of technology. And the reason is that the island was filling, and they didn't have pastures uh, that they could afford to use to feed their farm animals. And so, what would you do next growing season if you lost your greenhouse, if you lost your walk-behind tractor, your most important piece of technology, and you had produced twice as much? Okay, this was the task that several generations of farmers in Japan were faced with. And so, historians call this the Japanese Industrious Revolution as opposed to the Industrial Revolution that was happening over here. The and it's thought that the Japanese are harder working and more efficiency-minded efficiency than the rest of us. And there's a bit of historical basis for this thinking. And they did it. I'll show you a couple of uh, tools that they used. Essentially, they used process tools. Okay? They didn't have their technology tools. They used better process to increase their production. Uh, one of the most powerful was collective work. And on the Amish neighbors, I used to go over to John Yoder's house on Saturday morning, harvest the corn. And then on Wednesday morning, we go to Daniel Miller's house, and we'll harvest his corn. It's much more efficient to work in teams. It's much more efficient to share equipment. Okay, we don't have a shared equipment culture in North America. In North America, in North America, we used to, and many Amish and Mennonites still do share large pieces of equipment. However, I grew up on a 500-acre corn and soybean farm. And we were expected to, to, own our, our, to own every piece of equipment, even a $70,000 corn planter, which made it, would have made sense for, for neighbors to co-own. Anyhow, they figured out a, a very uh, intricate collective work system that still exists in Japan today. You don't typically, as a farmer, sell food directly to a customer. You work in a collective and you grow food for the collective. And then they reshape, refashion their tools. Uh, their oxen-driven uh, implements to be used by humans and in so doing, increase the precision of those tools. Okay, precision as at the heart of the lean system, they did not increase the productivity necessarily out of the tool, but they increased the precision from the tool, so less waste was in their production system. Okay, and if you want to go down, go down a, a long internet rabbit hole, punch in farming tools of the uh, pre-modern Japanese, and you'll find tools that it would make you droopful, that I wish we had access to here. Uh, and uh, that they really, uh, it was a flourishing time for the origami tradition, the samurai tradition, and for tools. And that tradition continues. Uh, uh, if you're an Instagram person, I, the only farms I follow on Instagram are uh, the Japanese. Uh, and the small farms in Japan have, uh, they're way ahead of us. Even in, North, even in the United States, way ahead of us in tool development. And I've always had this beautiful tradition of small tools for small farms. Because in the US, our best agricultural engineering has always gone to the John Deere company has always gone into large tools for large farm businesses. In Japan and Korea and these other places, in smaller countries, they, their best agricultural engineering has been devoted to excellent tools for small, small growers. <clears throat> uh, we tend to think that if we uh, can be efficient on a per acre basis uh, in commodity cr crops, that that's being really efficient. And then we started to think about square foot growing, be efficient on a square foot basis. And once you see these farms in Japan, they're thinking on a square inch basis. 
How can we grow radishes every square inch? And, and we picked up on some of these ideas and we now grow our early radishes in uh, 50 cell uh, plugs uh, using every single square inch and using uh, leftover room in our propagation house. Okay, here's a derivative, a direct descendant of that rice transplanting uh, tool. Oh, I showed a couple images. This is a paper pot transplanting uh, tool that I can transplant 264 uh, transplants in about 40 seconds. And we'll transplant most of our vegetables using this me method here. And most sugar beets in Asia, the Nippon sugar beet, uh, the Nippon sugar beet comp comp in northern Japan developed this tool for the sugar beet industry. And most sugar beets in Asia are growing using this exact method here. They have gangs of three or six and do larger acreages with it, but it's the same, same essential process. Okay, so by comparison, what was going on uh, in, 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 in North America at that same time was the Industrial Revolution. Does anyone recognize the tool here? You know, raise your hand or just yell out if you recognize it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it, we call it a re... A re so same thing, probably. So this is a McCormick, a McCormick company developed in McCormick Reaper. And it's considered historically to be the, be, to be the beginning of more with more agriculture. And the reason is we were pushing the Native Americans off uh, the, the land. And suddenly Ameri these American farmers had tens of thousands of acres opened up. You can imagine their eyeballs popping out of their heads. See the amount of production they could get into if they had the technology behind it. And so that's been always the thinking in American agriculture, always a push. And I grew up on a, this large corn and soybean farm. That was how you became a farmer, how you stayed in the business with, was through constant expansion. Every year you purchased or rented more farm land, you upsized your tractor, you put in more green bins, you get bigger every season. That's how you become, that's how you stay, you, there's no other option, okay? And this is the historical context for that thinking. So the, it's very, the mass production agriculture has had a very long arm, and it continues, and it's very destructive. And, and I want to show some statistics. In, in the UK, there are some, some very parallel statistics that I think is very interesting. If we take a, a wide-angle view, and then we're going to zoom in on the lean system. But just look at how many of us are now engaged in agriculture. Fewer than 2% in, in the US, and down to 1.4% here. Okay? Just a, in 1790, that was not too long ago, we had almost, we had 90% of the population, both countries, engaged in farming of some sort for a living. And look, look, look the core, the, the obvious uh, result is that we have now huge farms, uh, obscenely huge farms in many cases. And the, in the U.S., they say our farm size is doubling every 20 years. And I've heard it called the most rapid landmass consolidation in human history. And it's happening sort of beneath our noses. And so here's is what it looks like in linear fashion here. And these are not, these are not old or ancient statistics. These are very new numbers. <laughs> the decline, the sharp decline is happening as I'm standing here talking. Okay, and it's very personal for, for me. The last, or last season that our 500 acre corn and soy operation was a viable business was uh, 2018. Okay, we're losing that. There's just no future. That's not a big enough farm at this point. Purdue, Purdue, Purdue University tells us we need to be at 2,000 acres if we're going to make a living doing the corn, in the corn and soybean business. Okay, here are some UK statistics. However, the trend is, you'll see the trend is very similar. And yet, look at life expectancy in both places. How is our agricultural system working for the people? Okay, the Japanese farmers increased their lifespan by 10 years during the Edo period. 10 years. They increase the lifespan. And yet, we are living a shorter lifespan here with our more advanced agriculture. And of course, we could give a whole presentation on type 2 diabetes, the number one health epidemic, including children. It's a direct result. We know the science is very clear, unambiguous, the direct result of corn syrup overconsumption. So in the US, our debts are skyrocketing. Uh, 416 billion at this point. There's a 16 billion dollar bailout package that is given out to commodity craft farmers on an annual basis, twice the amount given to the automobile industry, and yet we still have these kind of numbers. More than half of all farmers have lost money every year since 2013. And there's no better definition of a failing industry 
look at this, 24% of farm bankruptcies, or 24%, 2019 over 2018. And yet there's hardly conversation about what's happening in the farming community. However, there are impacts. You know, my father is a depressed person. And I'll admit that the family, it affects the whole, it, ha it affects the entire family system. And in the UK, one agriculture worker per week uh, commits suicide. And there's a bit of tough news for those of us in the local food movement too. It's, just, it's not just the commodity crop. In the US, you can see the numbers for what they call direct to consumer, or the local food sales. We really, we really have peaked. Okay, and the business was booming uh, in 1997 all the way to 2007. And then Target and Walmart and all these big box stores started providing organic foods. And we no longer have a niche on the natural organic food market. It's more convenient for customers to do a one-click Amazon order. They say that farmers markets have peaked. Uh, from 1997 uh, and onward, we opened up about 8,700 markets in the U.S. Amazing new boom in the local food sales industry. And yet every farm conference that I've been to in the last three years, you hear this term over and over again, there's farmer's market saturation. It's hard to get into farmer's markets. And when food vendors leave markets, it's often artisan vendors and craft vendors that replace those food vendors at markets. So there's less total food being sold at our farmer's markets, if that makes sense. And then I talked about this yesterday during uh, the panel discussion, but CSA retention, more than half the CSA farms, are, and most CSA farms in the U.S. lose more than half their customers on an annual basis. And that's because of the competition. And there's, uh, there's a conversation uh, in, in England as to what local food means. 25% of UK food labeled as local was from, not from England. And I should say in the U.S. I've seen Mexican food labeled as local. Among small-scale farms, just 10% of us actually obtain our income from farming. And so that's the reason I say the sustainable food movement needs to take efficiency more seriously. If we're going to change the food system, we have to be making money as we change the food system. And so here's where some lean and efficiency ideas come in. And I should say that I'm going to use the language of lean. However, every traditional historical farming Every, cult, every traditional farming culture has had an efficiency tradition. I'm gonna, my point of entry is the Japanese because they've codified their system perhaps more than others. However, these are ideas that are ubiquitous when you look at traditional farming systems. Uh, so this is not a doom and gloom session. I'm going to turn the ship the other direction here and to say that there are amazing and incredible opportunities for small-scale farmers who are just getting into the business that did not exist even when I began 15 growing seasons ago. And the first is that sales to institutions, sales to places like this farm conference, sales to schools, sales to hospitals. Uh, these types of sales are up by 288% in the U.S. I couldn't find U.K. statistics, but I know those are on the upward trajectory too. Every time I go to a farm conference, I'm very tempted to pick up the phone and ask if they have a supplier for their tomatoes or lettuce or other vegetables for their lunches. I know I've got a ready market at these farm conferences. And I've in fact done this. I've sold food to the farm conferences I'm going to. So the restaurant boom would be the second trend, and that's happening in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, the number one restaurant trend is what they call hyper-local sourcing. So restaurants, uh, chefs who are growing food in the back end of the restaurant, or securing food from um, you know, a mile or two from the restaurant. Very close sourcing. It's very important for restaurant eaters in the U.S. And the, the young people, the millennials especially, are pushing this. And 43% uh, like the purchase food labeled as local. And local is the sexiest, the stickiest term uh, that you can put on a food at this point. And it's way surpassed even organic. And that's true here, uh, too. Uh, in the UK, 42% were likely to purchase food uh, labeled as local. Okay, and so we have this uh, dichotomy happening, this schizophrenic agricultural system, where the fastest growing farm types are the gigantic farms. No bones about it. They're winning. And we have, the, at the other end of the spectrum, we have female-led, people of color-led farmers, twice as many as 20 years ago. Far, young farmers. Uh, farming is the top career choice uh, among millennials. Uh, it's not always a successful career choice, but it's the career they say they want. 
And then this very sexy term that the USDA came up with for farms like what we would have, we'd call us ex-urban micro farms. In other words, small-scale farms on the outskirts of urban places selling food directly to urban customers. Okay, these are the growing edges of the, of the food movement at this point. Let's go to Jap Japan after World War II. And I want to revisit the Japanese context because, because lean does, it, it, the indus, Japanese industry does deserve credit for importing efficiency and lean thinking. Because this is the context, this is what happened to the, the, the Toyota. You're looking at the Toyota after World War II. We had bombed out their factory. They had no one producing bumpers and tires and engine components, everything they needed to assemble their vehicles. They had no capital, next to no capital to work with. And obviously we bombed out their infrastructure. The roads had vanished. There is no market for vehicles in Japan at that time. And so, so what is a small company like Toyota to do when they have these huge automated factories in the U.S. compete with. So Ford, GM and Chrysler, this slide was greased for mass production, for mass production automobile manufacturing. And the U.S. companies had a total run on the international car market for decades. It wasn't until 1980s that Toyota finally caught up with them. And so Tichi Onu helped design the lean system uh, in, in, the Toyota, uh, in the Toyota context. They said, we're going to try and catch your productivity, and we're going to try and do it in about three years. So we're not going to produce more vehicles than you, but we're going to use less labor than you, and our costs are going to be lower, and we're going to be as productive. And of course, they had to do it without large capital investments. And their workforce, they had to do it with these rice farmers. The first workers at Toyota brought this lean efficiency thinking with them, uh, and I believe that they deserve the bulk of the credit for the success that Toyota has had. Okay, eventually Toyota became number one in profits, the most profitable car company by many factors. Uh, I've heard they're eight times more profitable than their competition. Uh, just think about that. They're not twice or three times, they're eight times more profitable than their competition. Uh, they're number one in employee retention. Okay, a worker at Toyota works uh, on average 30 years, unheard of, unheard of in any other industry for a worker to work and they're so long, and we'll get into some of the reasons. And then they're number one in market share. They're selling more vehicles. And so something is going on that we should be copying is what MIT professors decided what they would do is send a team, uh, send a team or, and, and figure out what's happening. And they did. And Jim Womack uh, headed up that team. And he's come out to visit our farm on a couple of occasions. And he said what the Japanese, he told me that the Japanese told them, we don't use uh, a codified system. It's just our way of doing things. And the MIT professors, are, they're academics. They need to codify what they're learning. And so it was, the, it was Jim Womack and those folks at MIT who came up with the term lean production and who codified that system. And Taiichi Ono himself, uh, there's now a little chat book that uh, has been translated from the Japanese a couple years ago, uh, where he goes into, very, into, into fascinating detail of how they employed this rice farmer thinking on the shop floor at Toyota. Okay, so what we've tried to do is graph lean thinking onto our farm. And let me give you a little bit of history and tell you who, uh, who, I, who, I, who I am. <clears throat> so we're a four season specialty crop farm in Northern Indiana. And the acknowledgement here, we have to acknowledge that we're farming on what should be owned by Miami and Potawatomi's. It's our 15th year in operation. We have three part-time uh, people at home doing the, doing the work. And we have this crazy local commitment, uh, which was not, so at, we began by selling food to the highest end chefs in Chicago. Okay, these are three Michelin star chefs who wanted pencil thin carrots. And we worked on a farm for four growing seasons and that was their market. And that's where I learned how to grow petite arugula and where I learned to, to grow turnips the size of marbles. And this is what these chefs were wanting. And we began by selling food to these faraway markets. It's about a three hour trip. And then every season, we're not, I'm not, I'm, we grew up Mennonite, we don't like dropping. <laughs> and so every season we want to close the circle. And so this, the second season we said, let's do two hour trips. So we developed a council within that two hours you know, circle. And then next season, let's do half an hour. Let's go to South Bend or Elkhart and stay within that circle. And then eventually, 15 years in, we can proudly say that we sell to, uh, to only uh, accounts within a mile and a half of us. It took us a lot of years to develop those accounts. And now we are a net zero farm and we're working as quickly as we can to decarbonize our operation to stop completely the use of fossil fuels. 
And we're, most of our food is, whole, is sold at a whole, to wholesale markets. And we do have a booth at our farmer's, farmer's market. And we've really leaned up. We went from working 60 hours a week to less than 40. Uh, five acres to now half acre in production. I uh, went from using thousands of tools to now just a handful of tools to get all of our work accomplished. Now, Lean says you need to be honest uh, about who's really running this ship. And I'll be honest, our little kid here is probably running the roost. And you want to farm, so we wanted to farm anyhow so we could raise our kids on a farm because we both grew up in that, uh, in that context. And we wanted the freedom, that farming and running your own business of words. And yet we found ourselves working on behalf of the farm. The farm wasn't working on our behalf. We're working for it, if that makes sense. My friend Chris Blanchard, he passed a couple years ago. He said a farmer, a far, a farmer is like a two-year-old, and it, it fits. We, have, we had a couple two-year-olds in the house in the last couple of years. And so a two-year-old, is con a farmer is constantly unruly. You have to set boundaries. And farms and kids are better, are better when you do have some boundaries around it. Okay, so they're the full-time workers and the part-time workers here. And there's our little half-acre operation, and we have a 5,000-square-foot uh, four-season greenhouse. And we have some circles that we draw around us. I talked about the need to set boundaries, and these are the circles that have made us more efficient. Number one, profit metrics, crops should yield $3 a square foot, or we're not going to produce them. Number two, $40 should fit in one of our harvesting totes. We harvest everything in 10-gallon totes. Uh, crops should go from field to cooler at $100 an hour. In other words, from the time we begin our harvest, pick up an, a knife and begin to harvest our, our kale or whatever we're harvesting, we should be able to pick and prep and get into our cooler uh, that crop at a rate of $100 an hour. And then sales activities. From the point in which our delivery vehicle leaves, leaves the property to the point in which it comes home, did we move uh, this amount of food? Okay. And then we have, like I mentioned, these value metrics, too, that are constraints that are important to us. Okay, every square inch is used uh, all four seasons uh, in the greenhouse and 10 months uh, of the year outside of the greenhouse. And we use a compost system, if I have time, we'll get into. Okay, like I had said, I'd grown up on a corn and soybean and cattle farm. I, for some reason, went and got a degree in philosophy. And I get, on, so I get on high horses all the time, so it serves me okay. And then uh, we both grew up in Mennonite households. She, her family did a lot of canning. The garden was huge, it was as large as a lot of market farms. And uh, in the beginning, we were poor. We didn't have money. And so we bought this house uh, on the edge of Goshen, the town, the town that we live, live, live in. And it was a very cheap house. We couldn't, Rachel and I, before I came, we were, we were kind of going back and forth about how much we paid for the house. It was between 10 and 15 10 to 15,000, it wasn't much. And it should have been, they were gonna bulldoze the house and it probably should have uh, been a bulldozed uh, house. However, we were interested in, in the, there's a clay bottom tennis court next to the house, which is what we were primarily interested in. And so the first thing we did, the first week we owned that property, we tilled in that clay bottom tennis court and started growing vegetables. And of course, we quickly learned a tennis court wasn't big enough. And we started to rent plots all around town. We had six or eight plots uh, that we were renting, and it was becoming uh, a, te a tedious uh, task to load all of our tools up all the time and bike around in the plots and to not be able to make the infrastructure investments that we, we needed to make and wanted to make in order to, to grow our business. And so we purchased an Amish, uh, and originally an Amish a dairy, uh, as a five-acre Amish dairy farm, and we, conver we converted this to be a vegetable farm. We converted the, the dairy processing room vegetable processing place. We put up our greenhouses. And our goal, like I said, we had a growth mindset. We want to grow as quickly as possible. And so we built these greenhouses as quickly as possible. And we worked uh, 60 hours a week as a conservative uh, estimate. And did I mention that we had back-breaking systems? <laughs> a lot of bending over, a lot of hand tools, and we were completely worn out. And then this happened. Okay, so we had built one of these Elliott Coleman movable greenhouses. And it worked, it moved. And when we heard the thunk, it was a literal turning point. We heard the thunk and we thought, this might be the, be the end of our business. We cannot keep going in this trajectory. We've invested everything that we had into our new tunnel and to see it on the roof was just completely demoralizing. And I'll tell you what happened is we were going back and forth. Should we continue the business? Should we go back and get degrees and things that paid? And within a week, 
uh, we received a check, and one of our CSA customers uh, included a note with his check and said, we heard what happened, and we want you to keep in the business, keep growing our food. A day or two after we received that check, one of our chefs got a hold of me, and he said, we really need your tomatoes in here for as long as possible, and what's it gonna take for you to grow tomatoes that we can have in six or eight months? And I said, I, I'll be honest, I need a new greenhouse. And he said, okay, you buy the greenhouse, and I'll come out and I'll help you put up the greenhouse. And so, even as Rachel and I were on the fence, our, the community behind us was telling us, we want you to stay in. <laughs> so we had a lot of thinking over, Rachel, that we're of the generation that wants to, we document everything. And so Rachel snapped the picture a minute or two after the greenhouse landed on the roof. This is actual documentary proof <laughs> that we had some thinking to do. And the only problem is there's only one uh, Heineken in the picture here. <laughs> okay, let's go back to Toyota and the rice farmers and show you how they did it. And I'll show you a little bit how we employed that thinking on our arm. First is to get organized. I'll get into more detail here. Second step is to precisely identify value. Get this information from your customers. And you heard the intensity of the drummer yesterday morning. You know, they apply that same intensity into listening. Okay, they call it the Genshi Gambutsu method, into listening to their customers. Uh, cut out the muda. Anything that's not in service of adding value for your customer. You've intensely listened to the customers. And now, next, you're gonna intense, you're gonna take an intense lens to your, to your production system and get it and root out anything that's not in service of delivering for those customers. And then Kaizen, and these fourth, practicing impro continuous improvement every growing season. A very powerful, very powerful formula at the heart of the lean system. So we needed capacity, okay? We did not have time or money uh, to upscale our business to be able to produce enough food for our customers. We needed capacity. We didn't have money for capacity. We didn't have time to build capacity. And so uh, we employed lean thinking to impre increase our capacity. Here's how it works. If you can shave just half a day a week from your work process, you can take a whole year off every 10, go on a big, long fishing trip. You can also take that time and put it back into your business, and that was a secret of how Toyota surpassed uh, their American counterparts. If you can shave just 5% of your cost every growing season, and, and not increase your production, even just keep the level production, you have grown your business by 50% growth margin, a very respectful rate of growth for any business. A very simple task that I recommend and that we still uh, practice is we print the expense, we print out our expense ledger at the end of every growing season, and then we ask a simple question, which is where's the 5%? How could we cut 5% of our cost going into the next growing season and still produce this thing? Okay, so let's go through those four in more detail. And I'll show you some examples of how we employed those concepts. And I, only, I do wanna leave some time for questions. So first is get rid of anything non-essential. They added everything coming in to our farms. You go to farm conferences, look at seed catalogs. There's too many, too many seeds and tools and supplies available to us. Okay, the World War II generation, their task was to keep everything. You know, our task is to not keep everything, to edit precisely what we need. Okay, three rules for sorting. Get rid of anything that you don't use on a weekly basis. Find the fewest number of tools to get the most work accomplished. And then create a red tag room. And I'll explain what that is in a second. So here's some before and after pictures. We decided to keep every sho sho shovel and fork that was made in Indiana and get it onto our property. And we combed it and said, okay, this is what we're actually using and let's get rid of everything else. Okay, and then the red tag room is the vacuum cleaner. Essentially, it's a room that you're putting your items in, you, sort your, you, know, you go through your items, you sort what you're using, what you're not using, and then anything you might have a question mark next to, you put it in here, and then give yourself a month or two, and then after a couple of months, get it off the property. Okay, second step, set in order. Uh, the rules are these. You want to store tools where you're using them, so don't use a centralized tool storage area. Spread them out. You put them close to their points of use and keep them at eye level, easy to reach. And so you'll see tools hanging up on hooks and such all over our property on magnets, and they're at eye level location, and we use a 10-year-old test. A 10-year-old should be able to come on uh, to the property and achieve whatever tool we ask them to get. So if a 10-year-old can't find the ho uh -oh, then you're not storing it in an, in, an, in an obvious enough location. And then use visual, visual system ma management to, uh, to sustain the system. 
And essentially, lean is all about pictures. Pictures are worth 10,000 words. And so you want to do sorting. These first steps as part of your everyday work. And the literal translation in Japanese means you want to perform those first steps that I went through on an automatic and routine basis without telling people to do them. And so here's the key, is pictures. So we take a picture of each of our working stations when it's in its perfectly clean condition. We call it the ticket to zero picture. And then when it's time to take a space down to uh, its clean condition, we just tell workers, hey, there's your reference. Okay, look at the picture, make it look like this picture, and we don't have to give a lot of little instructions. So you'll see pictures all over our farm. And so the whole po point here is not to have a necessarily a beautiful, um, beautiful farm, although that is a result when you don't have stuff you're tripping over. The whole point here is, that, is productivity. And we know through research that the research is very clear that we're the happiest and we're the most productive when we have exactly what we need and not a, a, not a thing more in front of us. Okay, step number two. I'll tell the story briefly of how Toyota designed the 05 Sienna. Is they sent an engineer over to North America, their primary market, and they told that engineer to drive a van in all parts of Mexico, the US, and Canada. Okay? And to just listen, Genshi Gambutsu, listen to those customers. So they found in the western part of the US, we drive long distances, and we eat five course meals in our vehicles. Not a cultural tradition in Japan, apparently. And so they designed a beautiful flip-up console. And the new, Sienna, new generation, uh, and they put about 500 cup holders in it, uh, one every two inches, so there's no excuse not to have a big, you know, not, not to have uh, several soda pops in your vehicle. And they went to Ann Arbor, Michigan, just a few hours from our farm. And that engineer went to the Home Depot. And he didn't go in, he just stood and observed how our customer using their vehicles. And what he observed was a lot of frustrated customers. People wanted, everything is four feet and eight feet by eight feet dimensions. Okay, plywood, drywall. And we're a very do-it-yourselfer culture in the US and he found a lot of people strapping these sheets onto their vehicles and couldn't quite squeeze them in. And so he phoned home from the parking lot, phoned home uh, and said, okay, the next Toyota the minivan that we produce, we have to fit a four by eight sheet of something in it. And if you own a minivan and produce after, the, after, you know, after that uh, happened, then you'll be able to get a four by eight sheet of something in it. Because Ford, GM, and Chrysler, and everyone observed what Toyota was up to, and they copied. Okay, so these three questions in the middle are the important ones. What do they, when do they want and how much? They're at the heart of the lean system. And so what we do is we take these value sheets around to each of our customers on a yearly basis and have very specific questions, uh, very, get very specific answers to these questions. If we're going to sell ball fennel to Jesse, one of our chefs, how many inches of tops do you want? How many roots? Uh, exactly when you want it delivered. 2 p.m. or 4 p.m., 5 p.m. We'll get it to you exactly when you want it. And then how much on a weekly basis? And you don't have to supply everything to them. Incorporate your own values too. Uh, however, that's, that keeps your customers. And then we use the information from those value sheets to create a plan. And we like visual systems, and so we plan our, our a, a map, and we plan the greenhouse and the growing plots visually so, so all the workers have access to that information. And it's all based on the answers to those questions. Okay, now I want to reiterate, you do not have to supply everything, like tomatoes in winter. Okay, you need to do a little math and know what your lowest cost of production crops and your highest profit margin crops and offer those. Uh, however, uh, by talking to chefs, by talking to your local customers, this is a way to respect our local communities. We're not gonna reinvent the food system without bringing eaters along with us. And I see, I see lots and lots of enthusiasm for small scale farming. And I see about this much enthusiasm for talking to customers. However, we need customers. We need, we need eaters. And they're gonna be as much a part of changing the local food, the food system as, as, as the first. Now next we tackled the Muda. Like I said, the rough translation is waste. Just to give you an uh, example here is, uh, uh, the concept here is that there's only three types of activities in a work production uh, place, farms included. First is what they call type one Muda, necessary activities that aren't adding value for the customer like doing your taxes, uh, lawn mowing, washing the windows. Okay, you might have to do all these tasks, but you should be suspicious, do you really have to? do them, and could you shorten them somehow? Okay, type one Muda. Type two Muda, there was a list of seven Mudas, and we're gonna go over those in a minute. Pure Mudas, get rid of those first. And then just a few activities are actually value-adding activities. Okay, and I'll take the example of this 
the water container here. And my, my favorite way of thinking of this concept is that any physical action that you take to the product that causes the value of the product to go up is a value adding activity. And so when I put you know, the liquid in here, that's gonna add value. When I put a sticker on here, that might add value, okay? Uh, when I put a top on, that adds value. Uh, when I move it physically closer to the customer, it's a physical action, and then I'm taking on the object, causes the value to go up. Food is, a lot, is worth a lot more as it gets closer to the customer. Okay, does that make sense? And so it's actually only a small handful of activities on farms that add value. You know, putting seeds in, harvesting crops, and washing crops, packaging, and delivering, and anything else is MUDA, okay? And yet on most farms, 80% or more of the work is MUDA. It's not value adding. And so the task, the ruthless and uh, dedicated and intense task, you saw the drummers, uh, they take that level of intensity and sort, sorting these three activities, okay? And then focusing on the value. Okay, so I'm, we're gonna go through uh, most of these here in a second, but you can take a picture of this and post, you know, post this picture in the middle of your production space. It's the most important list, and we have it in the middle of our production space. These are all the waste in the lean system. So, so I'm just gonna talk about three or four of them here so we can get time for your questions. Uh, waiting waste is huge, and that's why I want to start with it. Uh, farmers love to harvest and hoard. We have a hoarding instinct. And Taichi Ono at Toyota even wrote about the hoarding instinct that humans have. as a very natural instinct because that's how we got through the winters uh, thousands of years ago, was we hoarded. And yet you want to keep food moving off your property. And I, and I don't like to see food on my property. I like to harvest it and get it in the hands of the person who's going to eat it. When food is sitting on my property, like in a walk-in, like in walk-in coolers, that's when all bad things happen. Okay, and mold, uh, disorganization, uh, defect, and so we've designed our system so that we harvest and then we put pack them into our uh, we use stripped-out hantas, and we crank up the air conditioning. We harvest directly into the vehicles, and then off it goes to our customers. And we have about a four four-hour turnaround time from the point in which an order comes to the point in which we deliver to our customers. We have to beat the Cisco truck, the Amazon truck. Okay, so defect. And the goal that we'd have is every seed is a success. And if it isn't, then defect entered in the time process. And so Lean would say, you want to know when did defect happen? And then when defect was happening in our case, it wasn't germination. We weren't getting nearly 100% germination. And so we started using these uh, germination chambers. So this is a chest, essentially a chest for each that we set up on end in any insulated container will work. And then we have uh, a, basically a crock pot that we set in here. And the crock pot heats the seeds and we achieve excellent germination with, with that method. And we simplified our germination to say that all crops, every vegetable has an ideal temperature at which you'll achieve you know, the best germination. And so we divide our germination in these three temperature uh, groups. Okay, and we switched from overhead uh, watering in our propagation house uh, to what we call bottom half inch to zero bottom watering. Okay, so what, the way it works here, we're going to fill these uh, trays. And we're going to put a half an inch of water in here, and we're going to let it go all the way down to nothing, so that a little bit of oxygen can get to the roots. And then we'll fill them up again as the plants need it. And there are just all kinds of advantages I don't have time to get into. But in England, they sell these. We actually have them imported. And they're wonderful little trays to use uh, for, for uh, efficient propagation. Uh, we started to transplant just about everything. We found that direct seeding, you leave lots up to chance. Okay, and we're much more consistently successful. And we like to even transplant stuff that's not typically transplanted, peas and turnips and beets and that sort of thing. And what we'll do is we'll put multiple seeds in one of these plugs. And then many of these crops will grow, grow out away from one, one another, and then we have success. I love the gravity seeders. You can now get these for 72 cell plug flats, 50 cell plug flats. And the way these work, there's two plates, and you'll see there's top uh, plate has a small, a, small, a small hole, and then the bottom plate has a large, larger opening. And you shake it and get the seeds to find uh, a home in each of the small holes, and then you, simply line, then you simply line up the two plates, okay? And the seed drops from the small hole through the la larger hole. And lots of growers in the U.S. are switching to this you know, very simple, no electricity system 
uh, which actually is a Japanese invention, okay, as opposed to sitting and putting seeds in one plug one. Okay, waste of motion, and then I think we'll open up for some questions. To work and to move, very different. Uh, it, essentially, what you want to do is work with some thought behind it. And so let me go back to this one here. So the way motion works, motion waste elimination works, is you put a person in a cor cor corner of the room during your most productive and motion filled afternoon, and you have them just trace motion. When did a worker move, and when did the product move? Okay, and what they'll come up with after about 45 minutes is what looks like a plate of spaghetti noodles. And then we, and the Japanese would say you an analyze the spaghetti noodles. Can you shorten noodles, straighten, or, or eliminate noodles? We've redesigned so many processes using this very simple uh, tactic. Just give you one example would be the spray station, where we took the legs off of our spray tables because we had a very funny looking noodle. Uh, as we squeege, we cleaned up, you would have to mop around all the legs, and, the, and we thought we could probably eliminate that noodle if we just hung our uh, tables. Okay, so very simple uh, changes make a big difference. I'll show you a couple of field management pictures. We did, I, I grew up on a corn farm. I thought we were supposed to plant and cover crops and till them, and, and we had a lengthy process. You, know, you plow your crop, you seed cover crops, you pack you, uh, seeds in, you mow the cover crop, you plow or till in the cover crop, and you till again for your seed bed preparation. We ha we're still haven't got a seed in. We've got at least six uh, steps, six passes, field passes, before the seed has even gone, gone in. And so we've tried to lean that up and cut out about half of them. Uh, we pull out the old crop, we'll loosen things up if needed, then we're just gonna, gonna add a couple of inches of compost to the surface, we're gonna leave it on the surface, okay? And this is, these are Haas sweeps, these are fixed sweeps, and a wonderful tool to just slice, quickly slice on your crops and makes, tool, makes crop removal go very quick. And then we're gonna apply compost uh, directly on the surface and we're gonna grow our, our crops directly into the compost. So it's very, here's some of the benefits. Besides being a super simple uh, system and fewer weeds, anytime you till two inches, deeper than two inches, you're only bringing weed seeds up to the surface. Uh, less work, slow release fertility, increased water, there's all kinds of benefits to this you know, very simple system. And there are all kinds of tools now available to make spreading your compost more efficient. So in the US we have companies coming out of these, uh, there's a hand pulled version, there's certainly tractor pulled uh, versions too. In conclusion, you're going to want to do Kaizen, which is continuous improvement, by every year getting rid of more tools that you're not using, decluttering your farm even, even more, by more precisely defining what customers are, are wanting, eliminating even more of the mudas, and do this in teams. Your workers are as close to the muda as you, so they're going to have at least as good an insight. And Teichi Ono said, worker at Toyota, this is why they keep their workers. They come to think, not build vehicles. <laughs> and I love that quote. And I caught vertical Kaizen, it'd be Rachel and I sitting in the house dreaming up more efficient ways of doing things, and horizontal Kaizen would be engaging the whole team. And many of the ideas I showed you here were horizontal Kaizen, the results of horizontal Kaizen. A couple of quotes to end. Uh, one of my favorites is, it says that we're living, uh, live and work at the intersection of nature and the human economy. And so let's participate uh, in a just way and efficiently in the human economy and respect nature. And then uh, E.F. Schumacher, uh, one of my favorites. Any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of cur cur courage to move in the opposite direction. Any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex. At the other end, where is the rich society that says halt? Uh, I think we have enough. And I think I'm looking at him here in the room. So thank you all. I appreciate it being here. Thank you.